My name is Sharon Mizoda, and I'm an arts writer and critic, uh, primarily for the Los Angeles Times, but I also write for other publications and um, KCT's Artbound. I decided to write an article about Steve Roden uh, because I've been following his work for a few years now, and I hadn't written about him before. And I first became interested in his work because he's a very well-known abstract painter here in Los Angeles. And I hadn't known that he was also, you know, a musician and a film artist. And so when I saw this film project, which was some work he did with objects from his grandmother's studio, she was a sculptor, and it really had this much more rooted, personal kind of feel to it. It was, uh, I think, kind of a big step for him to do a show that was all video and, and no paintings. When I graduated from graduate school, I was making abstract paintings and the process was the same and I started to feel like I'm going to be making the same painting for the rest of my life. Total freedom was not a good idea for me. It would be difficult to consider myself a painter specifically or a sound artist specifically. I'd say painting is like the sun and all of the other mediums hover around it. When I work with sound, because I have no training or history, I just step away and kind of play. But I didn't start making music till I was in high school. I was in a punk rock band. It was of no concern to me to want to make music and not know how to make music. There was a sense of freedom and also a sense of not relying on technique and not being impressed with technique, but trying to find something that felt real and guttural and expressive. We are at Steve Roden's installation, Shells, Bells, Steps, and Silences at LACE. We really wanted to explore video and projection-based work. I first heard of Steve as a multimedia artist, somebody who was invested in painting and works on paper, but also sound. I would frequently go visit him at his home and we would talk about his work a lot and share our thoughts about what it meant to be an artist who explores work across a variety of different forms. And I think there's a kind of richness to that conversation that he and I have always enjoyed. Other artists or people who look at my practice and think that if I focused on one medium, I would be stronger in that medium and the other things are taking away from it. But I don't view my practice in that way. I'm looking for some sort of enlightenment. Where do all these things come together? And I'm not interested in making that easy for people. <laughs> He had this opportunity to go to the Walter Benjamin Archives in Berlin. So from the outset, he was very clear that this will produce a new body of work, that film or video would be appropriate for this, and he would want to include this in some way in the exhibition. So he goes to Berlin, and then I start getting these kind of strange emails from him. Like one was saying, oh, by the way, I've been performing John Cage's Four Minutes and 33 Seconds, you know, for the past year. So I'm doing that while I'm in Berlin. I'm doing it every day. So it's going to somehow inform the piece. I'm not sure what. And then he gets back from Berlin, and I get another email from him that's like, oh, I got this collection of stuff from the estate of Martha Graham. I'm not sure what it is or what I'm going to do with it, but I'll somehow figure out how this is all going to work. At this point, I'm not concerned in a negative way, but at the same time, I'm really struggling with understanding how he's going to pull this all together. After a while, I kind of let it sink in and it starts to make more sense. He tells me about the Benjamin work and Steve doesn't speak or read German. So to go to the archive of a major German philosopher, what is he going to glean from this? And of course, it's Benjamin's actual handwriting of the way in which Benjamin would cross out words and annotate his own writing became a kind of series of codes and symbols. I ended up looking at all the different ways he crossed things out and it was kind of a ridiculous thing to start looking at until I came up with about 45 different ways he did it. I don't think anybody's studied the archive in that way. As I started to ask questions, nine times out of ten they would look at me and say, you know, I don't know the answer to that question nobody's ever asked us before. Finding things in places where other people might just completely ignore or not pay attention 
has been a huge facet of the kinds of source materials that I'm attracted to. For me, it was a way of engaging with the writing process and the way in which somebody's thinking process is sort of laid bare. Now, keep in mind, he was all the while, every day he's performing cages four minutes and 33 seconds. I'm still not sure exactly what he did other than probably sit there and not do anything for four minutes and 33 seconds. So those are those two things that are kind of happening simultaneously. Naturally, Steve's inclination is to see the Benjamin notation as a musical notation, and Cage being an avant-garde composer. Um, so that's how Steve is going to start to read it. That's the frame he's given himself. Many of the symbols were a circle with a plus sign. So you're looking at one, two, three actions. And so that symbol would determine how many actions of sound making actions I would make. The same symbol exists with a red circle and a plus in blue circle with a plus. And so then there are other symbols that match those colors. And so I built these sort of streams of activity based on color coordination and numbers of actions. And then that determined the performance that generated the sound and the video. When I start to think about the Graham collection, I realize, well, Steve is a collector. Benjamin wrote about his own desire to collect things and our impulse to come to understand who we are as people through these objects, these things that we collect, the things that we give value. This magical thing happened where I ended up buying two cardboard boxes of junk that belonged to Martha Graham. When I started to think about building a score to generating a work, I couldn't figure out what objects to use to make sound. So I thought, well, I just got these two boxes of stuff. This is my orchestra for my piece. I then started going through these boxes of stuff and looking at Benjamin's symbols and trying to find relationships between things. It's a very personal way of moving through the world to connect things that really weren't meant to be connected. Sound and film is so immersive as a medium. And so I'm able to express myself in different languages and to explore specific languages in ways that I know more or less about. It's not about looking at work that somehow signifies an experiment is happening. It's more about working with an artist who is taking risks. And by risks, I mean failure. I think Los Angeles is a wonderful city for this because so many artists are engaged in process first, Steve being one of those artists. And if the outcome isn't necessarily the most important thing. I just know beforehand that I have to have enough time to be able to fail. Otherwise, I'm gonna throw something out into the world that it doesn't mean anything. The making of artworks is a learning process. The only way you can do that, I think, is by experimentation. And failure is this huge aspect of experimentation. I've pushed this thing to the place where it's fallen apart. I have to start over. I don't know everything and I'm trying to learn something I don't understand or I don't know. And nobody gets that the first time they try. And it's exciting. There's just something positive about being able to like pick up all these pieces and put them back together differently and suddenly you have this kind of moment where you're seeing things differently. My name is Gail Brandeis. I'm an author from Riverside, California, and I'm happy to be a writer for Artbound. Tio's Tacos is a little Mexican restaurant in downtown Riverside, and I was living in downtown Riverside several years ago and just happened upon it. The patio there had some interesting little sculptures made out of mufflers and things like that, and some interesting tile work. And over the years, the area outside of Tio's kept growing and kept getting more and more interesting. I decided to write this article because to me, it really speaks to art and place. Martin Sanchez honors the town he comes from in Mexico, but he also honors Riverside through his art. There are rain cross symbols everywhere. And his family is so integral into his process. Every item that's in his art really tells a story about his family. I think it's a beautiful love story as well. Voy por la calle de la mano 
platicando con mi amor y voy recordando cosas serias que me pueden suceder pues ya me pregunta que hasta cuándo nos iremos a casar y yo te contesto mi vida en Michoacán fue una, se puede decir, una vida normal de infancia, pero no con carencia de todo. Se careció de ropa, de juguetes, de, se puede decir, hasta comida. A los cinco años yo empecé a trabajar limpiando zapatos y lavando carros y haciendo mandados en el mercado. Yo me enamoré al verlo porque eran los del mismo barrio. Yo estaba chica, él estaba chico, lo miraba pasar. Él me miraba pasar y así empezó la historia. Lo que yo notaba en él que era una persona trabajadora y de muy humilde, pero con ganas de superarse. A los 17 años decidí venirme a Estados Unidos, como todo emigrante o la mayoría, pues tuve que cruzar dentro de un carro escondido y cruzando el cerro. Cuando llegamos para acá, este, yo lo acompañé en sus aventuras. Llegué como todo buscando trabajo, no llegué con una fuente de trabajo, no llegué con un lugar ya establecido donde llegar y todo, no. Llegas a, pues a un mundo diferente y cuando yo empiezo ya a trabajar por mi cuenta en Estados Unidos, fue en las naranjas y en los parques, pero después decido a rentar un, un carrito de hack dog. Pero los actos no me daba resultado porque los hispanos pues queremos tacos, tacos. Lo transformé a, para hacer tacos y empiezo a vender tacos en las calles con mi esposa. Y ahí es donde empieza a nacer tíos tacos. Cuando Martín era niño, tenía un grupo de amigos que él era como el líder. Entonces los niños empezaron a decirle tío o el tío. Entonces cuando él se vino para acá, le gusta que le digan el tío. Entonces puso tíos tacos. Empiezo a trabajar dentro, mi esposa y yo empezamos a trabajar. Ya cuando tengo controlado adentro dije, ok, ¿y ahora qué toca hacer? Yo tenía dinero, tenía poder, tenía todo, si tú quieres, pero dentro de mí no era feliz. Aviento mi cassette para atrás, recuerdo mi infancia y digo, wow, yo no tuve infancia, yo no jugué, yo no tuve juguetes, ¿y por qué no los tengo ahora? Y así es como empiezo a crear mi estrés que traía adentro. Empecé a sacarlo aquí en esto. Al mirar que todo el mundo tiraba todo, o sea, aquí la mayoría es, es desechable todo y a mí me daba mucha tristeza. Yo decía, hey, ¿por qué tiras esa cama o eso? No es basura. Pero si yo no lo tengo en mi casa, yo no lo tengo ahí en mi pueblo. Como uno viene de la pobreza, en los países de uno no hay mucho que desechar, porque todo lo utilizamos. Entonces él se sentía mal por cosas que no tuvo y quiso empezar a el reciclar y el reciclar y el reciclar. Los materiales que se usan, por decir, son los botes de, de soda, los botes de cerveza, las conchas de opciones, los huesos de menudo, los huesos de las carnes. Entonces, todo eso, lo que viene eh, embotellado o en, en sacos, yo no tiro nada. Yo lo re, cuando ya sacamos el contenido, yo lo reuso. Mis zapatos, cuando ya mis zapatos tienen un agujero, ya no los quiero, no los tiro. Los colecto y cuando tengo un puño se los pongo a un mono donde va su zapato. Mi esposa siempre quiso tener un, un, un nicho, un lugar dentro de la casa para orar. No tengo para ladrillo, no tengo dinero para comprar la bloque, pero tengo muchas botellas. ¿Qué pienso? Y tenía unos fierros viejos, esto, la, la estructura, unos metales que tenía ahí, dije, wow. Eh, tenemos ahorita en proyecto los dos monos que están allá a la orilla, que el, el, el siguiente proyecto es ponerles botellas verdes para darle término a esa figura. Esas dos estructuras es representando hombre y mujer, aproximadamente se va a llevar unas... No te exagero, pero yo creo que unas 20 mil o 30 mil botellas. No le creemos a veces el proyecto, pero ya cuando lo vemos encarrerado o cositas hacia adelante ya nos va gustando. I think that it's kind of crazy. 
kind of cool. My dad built things out of trash. You cannot understand it. It's undescribable. It's like if I told someone it's a bunch of things made out of recycled stuff. There's a bunch of monuments and you know weird fountains and stuff. You won't understand it. One man's trash is another man's treasure. We would try to clean out our closet, clean out our stuff, and he would, he would tell us, just save it, I'm gonna use it for something. And I would think, what could he use it for? Pero no sabía en ese entonces, tú sabes, porque cuando empiezas, hoy es fácil decir, pero son 22 años que llevo jugando. Pero hoy me doy cuenta que se acaba el niño que traía adentro. Entonces empiezo a ver que, que todo es productivo. A group in the city of Riverside didn't see my whole dad's vision through. The group would say that it was garbage and it made Riverside look bad. At the time, they were not full-blown projects, so it did make it seem like it was trash and he was supported. But my dad kept fighting for his dream and he kept working on his projects also as he was going to court. Now that the projects are halfway there, they see the vision that he had. He showed us a very well lesson learned, you know, that if you don't give up, you will make it. Todo esto es un retrato mío y de mi familia lo que usamos y es la vida, parte de la vida de nosotros porque si tú platicas con mi esposo, con mis hijas ellas te van a de saber decir qué es cada cosa y por qué está formada cosa porque ellas aquí crecieron, ellas aquí nacieron ellas lo miraron, ellas lo usaron, ellas lo tocaron para mí es un honor Yo cuando vengo aquí disfruto de todo aquí, de aquí si trae un aburrimiento, aquí lo, lo, lo disfruto My name is Lil Deshaun Bosse, and I'm a writer and the publications editor for UC Riverside. More than any other story I've written, I feel like Kelly Thomas' story, like people really feel like they own a part of that story. And that's probably why it was so, it went over so well. It really struck me because, you know, I live, I live two blocks away from where it happened. I know a lot of people who knew him. And for a while, there were a lot of protests going on. So. We were just surrounded by that energy of people trying to remember Kelly Thomas and making sure that there's justice for Kelly. I thought it was a really beautiful memorial to Kelly Thomas to just have the city of Fullerton just express themselves through art um, and just come together in one space in downtown. Every single cent from that exhibit went to the Kelly Thomas Memorial Fund. So in the video, I think um, it shows a unified Fullerton. Okay, okay, I'm sorry, dude, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. conversation about cops murdering someone. They, they didn't even care. That's exactly right. They, they didn't care, care they who was care. watching. He was someone that these guys figured out they could get away with, beating the hell out of him. He just happened to die because never in Orange County's history, not one single on-duty officer has ever been as much as charged until now. I didn't join this cause because I wanted to go protesting. I did this because I knew him. I would see him, I smoke, he smoked, we would chat, we would chat with the owners of local restaurants, they all liked him. He was cool, he was mellow, he was a kind of a hippie kid in a way. He, he was, was a fixture here. Yeah. You, couldn't, you couldn't help but notice him just by the way he looked. He had bright red hair, um, he was young, he was uh, vibrant, and he was very colorful. There were times where I could talk with him and have a conversation and connect with him. And when he was not doing well, he was talking to himself and he'd be talking to himself rather loudly. So he drew attention to himself. I would see Kelly a lot of times while like walking around and my interactions with him were almost always where he was very quiet, he was very to himself. He would bum a cigarette sometimes for me. He said very little to me and I never ever perceived him as a threat to me. Like, and, I, and I knew him, I interacted with him almost daily. People used to actually call him Homeless Jesse because he looked like me. <laughs> because he had a red, a red beard and long red hair, and they're like, oh, there's Homeless Jesse. I never got the sense that Kelly was a dangerous person in seven years of living there. I moved over to where the train station is, about 200 yards to where the point is where Kelly got killed, and I used to pass by him for, on a couple months from the time I moved in there before he got killed every day, a couple times a day. Like Jesse said, he seemed like he pretty much kept to himself, didn't bother people uh, for the most part. 
and he would sleep right there at the train station, a little alcove right near the tracks, um, and I could see him from my balcony. And I, I felt bad for him, but I didn't know anything about his personality. And I was really surprised and shocked when uh, one of my roommates had told me that he had gotten killed. And I asked how, and he said the police beat him to death. And I said, well, was he armed? And he said, no. And I didn't know anything about Kelly, but what I knew is I wanted to find out more. And from that first city council meeting after that happened in early August, I became very upset with the way the town handled it. And that for me was the part where I got started to get involved in local issues. Put your hands on the top. Oh, 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 oh. Okay, I'm sorry! I'm sorry, dude! <laughs>
called a whore, and they kept saying, why don't you stop? When are you going to stop talking about this? We're not ever going to stop talking about this because this was wrong. It was absolutely disgusting and wrong. So a lot of people came against us. They're still against us. And all we want is justice for Kelly. We will not be repressed by him anymore. If it's government or the cops or whoever, we're not taking it anymore. And this town rose up every Saturday for week upon week upon week and simply said that. The day I quit going to protest was the day that the DA's office filed charges, at yep. least against Ramos and Cicinelli. Mm -hmm. They could have expressed condolences for what happened to the family. They could have said, they could have promised that there will be a full investigation by a, you know, an outside agency. They waited for months before that was offered to them to do. They waited till the public pressure built. Yes. And so what I was out there protesting for was for progress to be made, for charges to be filed, for someone to be held accountable, and for somebody to own up to this. And I, I feel strongly about this. If, if it, no, we didn't protest, if we didn't go to the city council meetings and say what we felt and make such a vocal issue of this and the media didn't cover it, nothing would have happened to any of these people. It's, it's, never, happened happened. Happened. it's never happened before. It's never happened before. Here, here's the thing. They're saying that they're now writing a policy. Really? Someone has to write a policy to say that you shouldn't beat someone to death? If you ask another cop and you, they watch that video of that night, they'll probably tell you the same thing I'm going to tell you is, those weren't cops. Those guys that sat there and did the Simon Says, no, those those guys were thugs, murderers. It could have been me. It could have been The night of Kelly Thomas's show, I walked home from downtown Fullerton mm -hmm. at 1 o'clock in the morning, and I was scared and I lived two blocks away. Mm -hmm. Cops followed me, they pulled up right beside me. I've lived here my whole life. My heart was beating faster than I could count. The, the people, the murderers, I was sick and tired of paying for these guys who had just killed somebody. Oh. They're out on the streets. We were paying for that. As a human, I cannot let murderers run out on the street. It couldn't happen. These gentlemen, stepped up to run for city council. I mean, mm -hmm. they were willing to sacrifice their personal lives because they saw the injustice. I don't agree 100% with Matt. I don't agree 100% with Barry. I don't agree with Chris most of the time. But the point is, is every one of us saw what was wrong. This is growing. Kelly's helping this grow into a bigger and bigger thing where when these cops are charged, the cops that thought they could do this to somebody else, guess what? Your charges are waiting for you now. Yeah, help me! Yeah, help me, God! Help me! Please, yeah! Help me! Help me, please, yeah! Oh! Oh, yes! I can't breathe! things I think the art exhibit did was take something that had become kind of an abstract political argument and make it into something very human and very real you know and so it wasn't like it's not like a Republican Democrat libertarian whatever kind of argument you want to have which you know we've had here tonight a little bit it wasn't about that it was about a human being and I think art has that power to take something abstract and make it very particular I can say in words things but these people in the front row here they can paint the way I feel, how pissed I am, how sad I am, how sinking I am, how repulsed I am. I think what the artist brought to the exhibit, um, everything, all of their works were reactionary. And there were images that were very disturbing, they were difficult to, to look at, but also there were beautiful images. This whole room is just filled with talent, and they're not just talented, they have opinions, and they have passion, and they have compassion. And that's what this is. It's the, it's the expression of compassion. What we were hoping was that we could create a sanctuary-like environment that could display very emotive material that was kind of kept within a frame and that people could come in that may or may not agree. One of the things that, you know, that an art show like this could do is to provide an environment that's safe for everybody to come in and explore those feelings without having it thrown in your face. When we talk about what art can do or what art brings to the conversation, it's, it, I mean, we can see it as really the closest we can get to looking through somebody else's eyes. I found an image of him where it's kind of overexposed and a little bit blurry and he looks like he's not sure if anyone's really looking at him. My hope was that it would just be a really sensitive, beautiful picture 
that would last forever. And then I wanted to do something more, so I did another portrait just like that one. And you know how they put the black square in front of people's eyes when they want to be anonymous? That idea of taking his identity away from him, literally by bashing his face in, by taking his identity away from him. There were a couple of things that went through my mind when I saw John's pieces. And the first one is, it was immediately recognizable as the stills from the video. The second thing is, I looked at it, and because there was such debate over whether what happened was murder or not murder, whether these cops were right or wrong, by showing the video, you, there's a question of like whether art imitates life or whether art is trying to demonstrate truth. And by making a painting that was a frame from the video, it shows this is what happened, this is truth. Every night that we were working on the show, we were talking and then we'd end up crying. It was just after a really good talk with uh, Mike, I went up to my studio and it just happened. I had some images from the family and he was happy. He was with his family and he was beautiful and I wanted something of peace. This art exhibit has brought specificity to what was an abstract idea. And the understanding of what happened to Kelly was very difficult for me because I have worked with the police department. I have, have had a relationship with specific police officers for 20 years. Right now, the way we've positioned ourselves, it's us against them. And Those police officers are human beings. They have families. When they take their uniforms off, they're regular guys. What she just said just made my, my heart beat a little faster because um, when I created my piece, it was a picture of a little protester girl. She had a sign that was actually bigger than her and it said, who are the good guys now? And I was thinking, you know, I don't want to go with this us against them because the only way that that we can all heal through all of this is to realize that they are human too. In my painting, I only saw 40 seconds of that video and I got disgusted. Mm -hmm. The point where he puts his hands and feet in front of him and says, I'm done, I'm submitting. Couldn't it have ended then? I think everyone who made one of these signs is, is an artist. It, it really, to me, this was one of the most powerful elements of the, of the exhibition and continues to be that because if you want to call something art with an agenda, that's art with an agenda. The collective effect of the exhibition was to humanize Kelly, and, and that's very important in the context of what happened to him, because what the police did was literally to dehumanize him. They, they took away from him that which makes him human, the most precious thing any of us have. They treated him as an animal. His life. All you have to do is walk in here right now, look at a few of the pieces, and, and what happens is it not only invites, it forces you into the healing process. And I, what I mean by that is healing is ugly. Healing is not pretty. And this is the process our community needs. We need to enter into the very ugly process of healing that begins with seeing what really happened, embracing it, and if we need to, weeping over it, and then allowing it to transform who we are. My name is Margaret Wertheim. I am the founder and director of the Institute for Figuring, which is a Los Angeles-based nonprofit organization devoted to the poetic and aesthetic dimensions of science and mathematics. There has been a revolution in origami over the past 20 years, where, first of all, the scientists are inventing new methods of origami and then those methods of origami are turning out to be useful in all kinds of practical scientific applications. Some of these paper folders are helping scientists to understand how proteins fold inside cells and how DNA and RNA fold up. Dr Robert Lang, who's a former physicist and now full-time origamist, he's been using paper folding techniques to work out how to fold and unfold large-scale telescopes that will be deployed in space. There have been in Southern California over the past couple of months a number of major origami initiatives and at the University of Southern California Libraries we've been doing an enormous project which I think is probably the biggest participatory origami project ever done. It's beauty and art and mathematics and engineering combined and it took thousands and thousands of hours of human labor to construct. One of the great things that Dr. Mosley has done is to bring a whole area of mathematics, fractal geometry, and make it accessible to people in a way that's really beautiful. 
this little cube, this little voxel of truth, becomes a metaphor for then, for how mathematics as a whole is embedded in the world around us. of origami is now a very sophisticated global art form. It's no longer just a craft. Conceptual art pieces, abstract sculptures, installation works. There are master paper folders in many different countries. Sipo Mabona created this incredible piece here called The Plague, which consists of 144 locusts made out of US dollar bills. You see the sheets of uncut dollar bills that he started with transforming gradually into locusts that then jump up and start swarming the gallery. He told me when he was installing the piece that with origami, there is always hope. I knew that there was a wide range of different types of origami out there, but I had no idea how wide the range was. There are artists in France who specialize in a type of paper folding called Le Camp and they crumple paper into all of these incredible organic forms. Another French artist, Eric Joiselle, folded paper and used water to wet the surface, and he modeled incredible forms like the amazing pangolin that's featured in this exhibition out of a single sheet of paper. Miri Golan, an incredible artist in Israel, devotes her life to using origami to bring peace to Israel. One of the most wonderful aspects of origami is that it brings together art and science. Many of the artists who created the most incredible works of contemporary origami are also scientists. Some of the mathematicians whose work is featured in this exhibition create modular origami works. And modular works are basically formed out of many different pieces of paper that are folded individually and then assembled into a large polyhedron of some sort. Janine Mosley has a PhD in computer science from MIT, and she has created many modular works using curved folds, which are incredibly difficult to create. My involvement with origami is lifelong. I started folding when I was five. My mom got me my first origami book, and I folded everything in it. Then later in high school and college, I started trying to design my own origami models. And after that, I worked for a long time writing geometric modeling algorithms and got back to doing origami again. And a lot of the math and programming that I did spilled over into the origami. A few years ago, some friends taught me an origami model, which is made with playing cards, business cards, index cards, whatever rectangular cardstock you might have. This is uh, what people call modular origami because the origami is made from modules. They're all the same. And they hook together like this and they form a cube. And my son made a huge pile of them and I saw two of them sitting side by side and I looked at them and I said, oh my God, look, you can take the flap from this one and hook it under the two corners of the neighboring cube. And then you can take this flap and you can hook it under these two corners of, of that. And now you have two cubes linked together. And you can just keep adding them. And you can make anything you can imagine out of cubes. Art has been about more than just faithful reproductions of life. It's been about making things that are abstract and expressive and beautiful. And I think that modular origami is a really great way to do that kind of more modern art. A fractal is an object that is infinitely self-similar. And what that means is that if you look at a small portion of it, the detail that you see is similar to the whole object. And if you look at an even smaller detail, it's still similar to the whole object. So at every scale, the object resembles itself. And you can't actually realize a complete fractal. So a fractal is a purely theoretical concept, but 
there are lots of things in nature that are fractal-like. The way the trees grow, the way that ferns grow, the decorations on shells, the way lightning forks. There's quite a number of artists who either consciously or unconsciously have represented fractals in their work. A very famous example, for instance, is Hokusai. His really famous wave painting has a big arc of the wave and then there are little waves within it and little tiny waves within it. And you can see the fractal structure in it. And when you actually put it next to diagrams of mathematical understanding of these structures, it's extraordinary how similar they are. It's ironic that mathematicians who'd been trained in another tradition actually were obscured from seeing this, but artists actually understood fractals long before mathematicians did. To me this is a subject which reminds us that equations are not the only way to know the world, that artists have really actually been seeing profound structures in the world that, as it were, their scientific brethren were late to come at. I decided to make a large Menger sponge and it took me about 10 years and I made it out of 66,000 business cards and I had help from probably a couple of hundred volunteers and I finally finished it in 2005 and then in 2006 I thought what else can I make? <laughs> so I began exploring the space of these fractals built on cubes and I wrote some software to design different fractals and I came up with the thing that's behind me, which we're calling a snowflake sponge. Because if you look at it on a diagonal, it has a snowflake cross section. It's a project that's happening at the intersection of mathematics, art and engineering. There's becoming a realization and it's an emerging movement that mathematics also can be a really interesting resource for artistic reflection. To my knowledge, there have been very, very few projects on this scale done. The USC libraries very much wanted to have an interdisciplinary project. And I think it was really brave of them to actually say, let's not do what everybody knows, you know, art and science. Let's do something really new. Let's engage with art and mathematics and engineering. Doing a project on this scale requires hundreds of people students from different disciplines who would, might never intersect with one another have intersected with each other through the making of this bizarre, odd, interdisciplinary object. One of the things that I think is beautiful about this project that resonates with what libraries do is that it's about building something physically. This is not a virtual project. One can make models of fractals with software, but you try physically making one it's a huge order of complexity and it's a huge commitment of time. It reminds us that we're not and never will be a purely digital culture. I've always actually been interested in art. I took art classes in college even though I was a math major. I was always dismayed by the attitude of the math students toward the art students and vice versa and I always wanted to try and bring them together and show them that they all had something to offer each other. So I really like the idea of bringing together different parts of a community to work on things like this. My name is Robbie Herbst. I'm a writer and I'm an artist. I like to write about grassroots underground creative projects going on in Los Angeles. Social practice is a kind of artwork where people come together and they experience something novel between one another. And in that experience, in that moment, is where the art is. Not in the sum of it, but in the happening of it. Speaking with some of the organizers of the Workers' Rug piece and hearing some of the workers' stories, it was very clear to me that the Workers' Rug was a place where the workers could feel feelings that they hadn't felt before and they could experience ideas in a group and share them with others and then possibly to transform them. Um, where an, in an individual's experience is woven into a community and is held by that community. And in a way that becomes a form of power. So the worker's rug is an object and an experience where people are sharing their stories to build something together. And that building is an identity of power as workers. A 
day laborer is a human being that's looking for employment. Whatever employment that human being can get. It's a lot of time spent working and sacrificing their bodies for really low pay. Here at the Downtown Community Job Center, day laborers come at the crack of dawn to look for employment. How that happens here is through a raffle. una camiseta como cualquier camiseta que uso para trabajar y en esta ocasión he decidido compartir el romperla como un símbolo del trabajo. Me gusta pensar en eso, en que el trabajo es algo que transforma a los animales superiores en nosotros, en humanos. La prenda que yo uso para, vez, para trabajar y que después convierto en herramienta, porque también se convierte esto, ahorita va a ser una alfombra, pero se convierte en herramienta porque uso, lo uso como trapos para limpiar. Hay una organización que dice que las trabajadoras del hogar somos hadas madrinas y estoy convencida absolutamente de ser una de tantas hadas madrinas a que equivocadamente muchos llaman trabajadoras domésticas y esta es la oportunidad en este momento para decir que solo somos trabajadoras del hogar, asistentes del hogar, hadas, madrinas, que simplificamos la vida de muchos al limpiar su casa, al cuidar sus hijos. Parte de mi vida, parte de mi esencia, parte de lo que nosotros contribuimos como inmigrantes el trabajo es un derecho y el trabajo siendo un derecho y siendo un acto dignificante se es negado a muchos por su condición de no tener un permiso de trabajo, por estar en un país que ofrece un sueño pero que llegamos y nos empiezan a decir criminales. Dicen que nosotros destruimos la economía, que venimos a dañar y no es así. Nosotros día con día contribuimos a la economía y contribuimos con nuestra cultura y contribuimos con nuestros pensamientos y sentimientos. Y eso va a representar esta alfombra. Mi nombre es Martín Hernández y esta camisa para mí es muy importante porque con esto vamos a hacer un trabajo de, de la alfombra de, de jornaleros, se podría decir. Esta playera, los últimos trabajos ha sido en el sol descargando containers y la mera verdad no es muy pagado y, y muy matado y, y, y llena de sudor y todo. Más que ya, la, ya está limpia, fui a lavarla. Mi nombre es Ricardo Rodríguez, soy jornalero del centro de Downtown, del Instituto de Educación Popular del Sur de California. Y para mí es muy significativo esta reunión, porque precisamente se enfoca en en la vida de los jornaleros, en los trabajos que realizamos cotidianamente y que nos da la oportunidad de expresar 
de comunicarnos con el mundo de quiénes somos y qué estamos haciendo en este país participativamente como trabajadores y como gente integrada dentro de un sistema social. Va a ser para algo bueno. Esta camisa que, es, que estoy poniendo aquí tiene 10 años conmigo. He hecho bastantes trabajos con ella. Este, de pintura, mi trabajo es de construcción, de pintura, la he metido a la, a la pintura. He hecho este, trabajos de estanco con ella. Para mí porque este es un proyecto que, que cada uno de que va a poner una prenda es para, es, este, es como que va a poner uno un poco de uno de, de, lo, de lo que uno hace, de lo que uno hace este diario, este, de los trabajos que uno, uno realiza. ¿verdad? Y no sé, no, no sé dónde vaya, dónde vaya a quedar a la alfombra, pero donde quiera que vaya, los que participe va, va a tener una parte de cada uno de nosotros que vamos a participar. Sí, por favor, no tomemos fotos, por favor. Sí, yo me llamo Luis y tengo tres hijos y nosotros vivimos en Arizona por ocho años. Eh, Arizona es un estado muy difícil, muy duro de vivir. Es inhumano por el clima, es inhumano por las leyes, es inhumano por por la forma de vivir allá, entonces esta camisa yo la usé cuando trabajaba en la construcción y también trae recuerdos de cuando mi familia se empezó a separar, trae recuerdos de cuando terminé siendo papá soltero por cinco años ya, al día de hoy, con mis hijos a un lado siempre y trae muchos recuerdos de tristeza, dolor, sufrimiento, de mucho trabajo y de sobrevivencia, más que nada, de sobrevivencia trae mucho, mucho recuerdo. Y para mí es importante venir y poderla romper porque siento que es un proceso de sanar, de sanar ese dolor, esas tristezas y agradecer también, agradecer porque pues de todo eso se aprende, de todo eso crecemos, de todo eso Aprendemos a ser mejores seres humanos. Aquí estamos en Los Ángeles, aquí estamos luchando, aquí estamos aún teniendo esa, esa lucha diaria para ser mejores, para, para crear un futuro mejor para nosotros y para los que tenemos atrás. En este caso serían nuestros hijos. Our clothes are what often create a visual identity of who we are and what we're working on. If there's paint on my clothes, if I have a collar or a suit, and this is an opportunity to take that off, rip it up, and put it back together very closely, intimately tied to another person's history. So this is Bernardo's story and Pedro's story and Jane's story, and they're all together in this rug. And people have said that maybe someday the rug is going to be the size of this room or the size of Los Angeles as we keep on collecting our stories. We wanted the fabric that goes into the rug to represent the people that, that put it in there. And who do we want to represent? Who needs representation? Who are the undocumented? Who are the unrecognized? We thought a lot about uniforms and colors of uniforms and blue collar workers and white collar workers and what color clothing people were wearing to do their labor in the city. Perhaps all of these colors of uniforms could be in one rug and that, that rug then becomes a city, it becomes a space. And we're also in an economic crisis, we're in a recession. A lot of parts of LA are in a literal depression. So we need to talk about work, recreate meaning through work, support our families through work. When they rip a shirt, they take out all that they have inside. Maybe they haven't expressed it any other way, but this is their chance to do it, right? This is their chance to tell their story and also rip that. And I feel that there's a lot of healing that comes with sharing a story, but also physically just tearing that. I was able to do that a couple of minutes ago and I felt really good. Take that, cafe. <laughs> People aren't necessarily always going to feel invited or welcomed into a museum for various reasons. And so the idea being that we can engage with audiences kind of in their everyday environments where they naturally gather. 
one of the highlights for me personally was an opportunity that we had to bring a group of members from EDEFSCA to the museum. For a lot of them, it was their first time ever stepping foot inside of a museum. And it was just a great way for us to build a relationship with the members of EDEFSCA and show that it's a two-way street of us going out into the community, but also inviting people and letting them know that CAFAM is a space that is meant for them as well. I feel like art can provide this other avenue of social change. So sometimes the art object itself, like this rug, can become a catalyst for a different way to look at the world. I'm seeing my role as one of a facilitator and mm -hmm. facilitating these conversations. We're helping to facilitate a different way of looking at each other in the city. And in the end, it was really important for us to just make this project about relationship building and time spent and sharing authorship and allowing ideas to evolve and letting go. We don't want the rug to sit on the floor, being something that's traditionally sort of trampled over, walked over, overlooked. We want the rug to hang on a wall to visually confront the viewer and propose questions about what is this, where did this come from. Y tú que te creías el rey de todo el mundo y tú que nunca fuiste capaz de perdonar y cruel y despiadado de todo te reías o imploras cariño aunque sea por piedad. ¿A dónde está el orgullo? ¿A dónde está el coraje? Porque hoy que estás vencido, mendigas caridad. Ya ves que no es lo mismo Amar que ser amado, hoy que estás acabado, qué lástima me das. Que llores y que te humilles ante este gran La vida es la ruleta en que apostamos todos. Y a ti te había tocado no más la de ganar. Pero hoy tu buena suerte, la espalda te ha volteado, fallaste corazón. 